For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in, my, in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is something in a man, yes, even in a man born again, that objects to God and wants to be independent of God. That's the essence of Romans 7. Maybe I can say it again. There is something in man, even in a man born again, that objects to God and wants to be independent of God. That's the essence of Romans 7. Alexander White said that in this passage, Romans 7, you have the greatest tragedy in literature. And he said something that I thought was very great. It is a greater tragedy than Macbeth. It is a greater tragedy than Hamlet. It is a greater tragedy than King Lear. And it is a greater tragedy than Othello. And most all of us have had to study these Shakespearean tragedies. Yet, my friends, they are stage plays. This is the real thing. That got a hold of my heart because I've read and studied and listened to the finest companies do Othello as well as some of the other Shakespearean tragedies. But Othello, I remember. I remember how that despair, I remember how jealousy so consumed him that he destroyed the one he loved and he had no cause for that jealousy whatsoever. It was something that gripped him more and more and more and finally consumed him something that he could not help. He didn't want to do it, but he did it. There's some of that, some of this in Romans 7. I want to quote Alexander White this morning further from one of his sermons. He was one of the great preachers of England. He says this, the seventh chapter of Romans should always be printed in letters of blood. Here are passions. Here are terror and pity. Here heaven and hell meet as nowhere else in heaven or hell. And that too for their last grapple together for the everlasting possession of the immortal soul. 
But farther on in that sermon, he says something else. And I quote him again. That's my only note this morning is a quote of Alexander White. I couldn't commit that to memory and be accurate. In its own wonderful way, there is not a more comfortable and hopeful scripture in all the book of God than this. And then my comment. In the process of coming to know the truth, and finally to be entirely possessed by him who is truth, we find ourselves set free. Romans 14 through 17 and Romans 18 through 20 are parallels. That is, they both say the same thing. Romans 18 through 17 states it, and Romans 18 through 21 restates it. They're parallels. And I want you to see that as you study this with me. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now look at 18. For I know, he's, he's, re, he's rephrasing the same thing, that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So we, what we have, first of all, is the condition. We find the condition of a man who wants to do God's will. We find a condition of a man who knows that the law is right. We find the condition of a man who's been instructed in the things of God. But, and we find that in within him, he has an inner delight to do what is right. Now remember, that cannot be a reprobate. That cannot be an outright sinner, for he's not like that. This at least and primarily, first of all, in the context of Scripture, is a man under the law. But don't the Calvinists get too satisfied or the Wesleyans? Because I won't let you stay that way before this is over with. But in the context, we must, we must recognize and we must realize that Paul is speaking about those under the law. And he's saying that, that David, David said he delighted in the law of the Lord. He said he delighted in the law of the Lord. And the people that were under the law, that is the, the Mosaic law, were persons, uh, those honest persons, persons uh, of faith, were persons who loved God. And they had a delight in their heart in their heart. Yet, as the Apostle Paul, as it was revealed unto him, their condition was one where they were dominated or so its influence and prevented them from doing what they wanted to do. And thus they came back year after year after year to be forgiven because there wasn't in that dispensation, the power to do what they wanted to do. So he reveals our condition. Now, it is not only the condition of a person under the law, but I believe that it is a person who is born again also. And I want you to bear with me while I try to explain myself. The big battle down through the centuries has been one or the other. When the church fathers first started, they said this is all under the law. That is, it is not the condition of a believer in Christ until Augustine. And Augustine said, yes, that's true, but I have found that to be my own condition. And he said, I believe, and for this reason, he said that when a man becomes born again, when a man awakens to the things of God, that man doesn't know how terrible sin is until God comes within his own being and this war sets up and he finds out how carnal he really is. Yes, yes. And so Augustine changed church history by his comments. After that, it's been this one and this one, a mixture and this one and this one and this one. And in my 50 to 60 commentaries, I never know what they're going to say. One says this and the other says this and so on and so forth. But I think maybe the most helpful comment came to me when I was talking to Brother Ham. I said, Brother Ham, what do, you, what do you have to say about Romans 7? He spoke immediately. He said, son, Romans 7 is a picture of the carnal man. 
a picture of the carnal nature. A man that is born again still has the carnal nature. A man that is born again has a fight going up in his breast. And so while, while I want to share with you that I primarily think that Paul is speaking of the man who is under the law, remember this, a man who is born again that does not continually follow the Spirit places himself right back under the law. That's what Sunday school is all about. That's what preaching is all about. And without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, without the, the, the Lordship of Christ every day, without, without taking our steps in self-denial, something happens to the man who's been born again, he places himself right back under the law. Not the Mosaic economy, not the Mosaic law, but the laws of the do's and don'ts. And he tries in his flesh to live up to them. And this is what he finds going on with him. What does he find with? He finds conflict. And that's what your next verse says. You have the condition, now you have conflict. Look at it. So, Wesleyans, Calvinists, I'm in both camps. And, I, and, I'm, not, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not there, my friend, because I'm trying to duck. I'm perfectly willing to hit head on. It's my privilege to do so. But I'm there because I believe this is right. I'm there because I believe this is realism. I'm there because I believe that the man, it is not a picture of the man who is the unregenerate, and it is not the picture of the man who is sanctified holy. It is neither. But it is the picture of the man who wants to do God's will under the law. It is the picture of the man who has been born again, but has the carnal nature and has not denied self, but finds himself in this terrible battle and he wants a way out. That's my position here this morning. I think it is a realistic position. Next, after the condition, is the conflict. Look at the conflict. You know what? If I'd ask every one of you to stand up and vote, I believe if you got up and voted, nearly every one of you would say, yes, this has been my experience. Now, I'm not saying it's experience of every man. It's very hard for me to believe that the Apostle Paul was like this. Now, some believe he was. But I cannot go with those great men who said that the Apostle Paul was like this in his filled with the Spirit state. I, I can't accept that. Now, that is because I'm honest with you. I cannot. He was, he was saved on the road to Damascus. He was filled with the Spirit three, day, three uh, days later. And because I know another man who is filled with the Spirit, who's walked with God in unbroken step, I believe this was not the experience of the Apostle Paul at his, at his best, at his infilling. I do not believe that. But I do believe that were he to let down on the essentials, he would have gone right in to experience this very thing. See, the Apostle Paul or anybody else. And I, that's my position on that, and I hope you can see it. A man that, is, that does not have the power of the Holy Spirit within him, that is not relying on Jesus, but trying to obey the do's and the don'ts, the law, the written code, will find himself in conflict, moral or under the law or in his Christian state. Look at these verses. This says it. And, oh, what a struggle. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. Now here's what's terrible. For what I hate, that, I, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now look down in our parallel passage, 19. For the good that I would, I do not. See, he says it over again. But the evil which I would not, that I do. I've, ha I've had that experience. I was saved when I was six years old. I wasn't old enough to know much about sin, and so I didn't have the experience written here until after I was a saved man. But after I was a saved man, whenever I neglected to read the Bible, whenever I neglected to put Christ first, I found myself slipping from the power of the Spirit, though I was still a saved man. I'm not talking about a deliberate backslidden condition. I'm not talking about being out of fellowship with God, whatever terms you may use. I'm not talking about finding myself in a state to, to be rededicated, but that was the result. That's where I found myself after a while. I found myself doing things that I did not want to do. I found myself doing things that I hated 
And though I, didn't, though I didn't break the commandments ahead of me, though I didn't break the commandments, the obvious and the open commandments, I, I found myself in bondage to the tenth. I found myself in covetousness. All right, discontented. Wasn't satisfied with my lot. I'll tell you, as long as the power of God was with me, as long as Jesus was helping, I could say with Job, though he slayed me, yet will I serve him. And I was up above the problem. You see what I mean? But whenever I wasn't trusting Jesus with all my heart, something happened. I slipped back under the power of the written code, and then there was a battle that set up in my soul so that at times I found myself doing what I actually hated. I believe that's most all men's experience. Tremendous. And it is so great. I want to go ahead and give you what has happened here. Romans 7 is the picture of a man, a, a man... The law of the mind, which is the inner heart, what he really wants to do, trying to get victory over, over the devil. You see? And it's a tremendous, and he's lost it every time. He simply lost it. It is not, as in Romans 8, it is not the Holy Spirit facing the devil. It is myself facing the devil. I'm jumping ahead, but look down here when he says, so then with the mind, I all by myself is what the Greek means. I all by myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I've got a dichotomy going on with me. All by myself, I'm trying to whip the devil. All by myself, not with the power of the Spirit, I'm trying to overcome it. What happens? I fail and I fall and I do what I hate. All right, you may, not be, you may not have robbed a bank last week, but did you criticize anybody? If you did, this is exactly what happened. Did you, maybe you didn't rob a bank, but maybe you, maybe you spoke against somebody. This is what happens. You don't want to do it, but you do it. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? You covet something. How many in this place has ever got the victory over their pocketbook? What in the world's going on with a man when he covets Something that if, that if really captures his soul will take him to hell and everybody else too for the love of money is the root of all evil. What is happening there? He's trying to get rid of covetousness without the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got to recognize that though you've been born again, there is a carnal nature. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't dominate, and if the Holy Spirit doesn't take it out, if the Holy Spirit doesn't kill the old man, the old man will rise back up and take over the soul and will rule. And will cause you to do things that you should not do. Well, quite an experience, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Lord, I ask thee to help me so it wouldn't be too hard on the people. I ask you to help me, Jesus, so that it would be lighter and lifting because I dreaded this passage, but uh, I'm not dreading it now. I'm thankful for the way that you're helping. So you have, you have a condition, you have the conflict, and then you have a conclusion. In these parallel passages. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's not escaping responsibility, but he's saying that a man who's awakened to the call of God and responded to the call of God does not want to do wrong, but he cannot help it. He will do it even after he's made a profession of faith. 20, looks at how he sums it up here. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin. Now, this is sin personified. It's the devil that dwelleth in me. So you have the condition. You have the conflict. And then you have the conclusion. And I think that it, the great truth of God here this morning uh, to be applied to our own souls would be a liberating truth if you and I can realize. I want to tell you something. We want to be very careful about the doctrines that grip us because the mind can accept something that's not true and, and cause uh, one's person to blind itself to all of reality. The communists really believe that we're nothing more than economic creatures. That is, a pure communist who really believes this subject. And so he lives and he works and he forms his kingdom and he helps the tyrants gain control of the world. Why? Because the power of an idea obscures all of reality. He doesn't know that reality is twofold, both what is seen and what is unseen. He doesn't know that. 
And Schaefer makes it very clear in his writings that a man who has a view of reality has a view of what's not seen and what is seen. Furthermore, Paul says this, what's not seen is rapidly passing away. What's seen, I mean, what's not, what's seen is rapidly passing away. What is seen is gone. It's gone in a while. This is beautiful, but it's going to be gone. This is wonderful, but it's going to be gone. But what's real is lasting forever. What am I saying? You can believe a doctrine and miss the whole thing God's trying to tell us because the mind blinds itself to us. You can get into some places. You say, Brother Hogue, you know, you sound like you're sort of wishy-washy. No, I'm not wishy-washy. My friend, there's nothing wishy-washy about Calvary. There's nothing wishy-washy about salvation. There's nothing wishy-washy about the cross. There's nothing wishy-washy about obeying God. And brother, that's the sub and substance. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, wishy-washy about faith. I'm telling you, it's all there. But I have to be very careful that I don't become rigid and become doctrinaire and be filled with dogma that blinds me to the truth. I think that's what's so beautiful about Brother Ham. He said after God sanctified him at Taylor University, then seven years later he put him down on his bed and took out of him some 30 to 40 things, and he named some of them. And I think that's tremendous. Because I was taught when a man was sanctified, he was entirely sanctified, and that was it. And, of course, what happened to me was I went and I made claim, and I asked God to sanctify me, and I was sincere, and I believed that he did it. But I got up, and I got in a place, and I found out that something was still in there. I said, what in the world is this? I'm sanctified. Somebody, oh, you'll get in a place somewhere. You've got to have it testified. But it was, it was at the end of his experience, of that seven years experience, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit in three days. E. Stanley Jones said, God can save you in one moment and sanctify you in the next. He's talking about entire sanctification. He can do that, fill you with the Holy Ghost. But he said it seldom happened in a lifetime. I guess he's never heard of it. It took Paul three days. Boy, that's cr- tremendous. Most of us are taking a lifetime. Not because God's not able, but because you and I don't take our steps closely enough. What does he do? He comes back and he grants us grace. We get back into the conflict and we ask forgiveness. We get, you know, our condition is this. But now there is a better way of living than Romans 7 proper. <laughs> and he's going to tell, tell us about it in Romans 8. In fact, he's going to give us a hint of it before we ever get to the end of, of this scripture. Oh, what, 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 if, what, would, what if our young people could get what I'm saying today? Oh, oh, it's liberating. It is. What if you get it? How much love and help is that going to be for them? Now, verses 21 through 23 are simply an amplification on the parallel verses. There are verses that explain the principle of what he's talking about in this other place. I find then a law. So he's given us the principle that, that when I do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And watch this. Bringing me, he's in a battle himself with carnality. Now what's happening? He's losing bringing me into captivity. A moral man, a man called by God, a man that believes God, a man that's asked forgiveness, a man that wants to do good, but the war is going on. And so he's trying to win that war. And what is happening? The carnal nature is too powerful. It brings him into captivity. I was so thrilled when I heard Sandy sing, and I heard it in one of the songs this morning of, about the, cap, the captive. This name will deliver the captive. I, I, oh, that helped me when I heard that this morning. It was so great. He said, for I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. I say again, I don't know where this was Paul's experience, but I do believe it's autobiographical. I do believe he has revelation, but I do not believe this to be a straw man. I believe that Paul had this experience. You can say he had it on this side. You can say he had it on this side. And I told you about the difficult I would have in believing that he had it after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But I, I know he had it if he lost the victory. I know he had it if Jesus wasn't first at every moment. It just seems to me as I read the apostle, he was so consumed by the passion for Christ that when God hit him on the Damascus Road, he was baptized three days later, that he just depended on God forevermore. And that's the way it seems to me. But there's greater preachers than myself who believe differently. 
I just want you to know that's not the argument. The thing is, my friends, this is the picture of the carnal man. And this is a picture of what happens to you and me whenever we try to live up to the Sunday school rules, when we try to live up to the teaching that I'm even giving now. That without the Holy Spirit is written code. This Bible is nothing more than written code. Oh, woe be unto those who have said that the Holy Spirit cease operating in 33 A.D. What hope is there for a man? Nobody then can answer the cry, Oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of death? I want you to know that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still operating. He's still delivering. He's still taking men out of slaves to carnality and slaves of sin. And I want you to know Paul gives us the answer. For he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he tells us, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I can't do it, but Jesus does it. And that is what sets the stage for chapter 8. But just before we get there, he restates the case. He sums it up. So then with the mind, I all by myself. When I'm by myself, independent of the Spirit, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He tells us what state we get into. Though we be moral, though we be under the law, or though we have repented, we cannot win this battle ourselves. But oh my... Chapter 8 is a different thing. And so in conclusion, I give you the man who has won. The man who has repented of his sins. The man who in the process comes to know how sinful he really is. But also the man who comes to be possessed entirely by him who is all-powerful. This is the man in Romans 8. And I don't think you can understand Romans 7 without going into Romans 8. In fact, Romans 8 is, a, is an arbitrary division. There is thou therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That tells you something that a man that is really in Christ is walking after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> For what the law could not do, it never will be able to do. That's my words there. In that it was weak through flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The man that is possessed by the Spirit of God knows victory. The man who is willing to deny self and not turn to the tyranny of the written code, not trying to outdo the devil himself, but trust God in first place, there's no, there's no condemnation while you're working it out. Because whenever something's done wrong, the Spirit pleads for you. Jesus is at the right hand of God. And he said, my little children, I don't want you to sin. But if any man sin, we have somebody pleading for us at the right hand of the Father. You don't have to be tyrannized of that. All you do is just say, Jesus, forgive me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to be banged over the head. You don't have to listen to the devil to say, well, you're not saved anymore. It's not true. Brother, I want to tell you, I've known very few people who got up as Apostle Paul did and went into the street called Street and were filled with the Holy Ghost in three days. I don't know many people like that, but most all I know went back to the life of the tyranny of the written code. And that's, there's where we see how awful sin is and see how weak we are and see that if we don't read and we don't pray and we don't witness and we don't obey, we don't pass the home test, we don't pass the road test, we don't pass the work test, we don't pass the leisure test, and brother, we don't pass the test. Only Jesus in us at all times can pass the test. He said we walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Romans 7 is a picture of the carnal man. On whatever side he's on. On whatever side of Calvary he's on. It is not a picture of the unregenerate man. For the unregenerate man does not delight in the law of God. And, and it is not a picture of the man who is filled and who remains 
mortified in his flesh. For that man lives in victory and walks in unbroken step with God. That's what invites me on. That invites me on because the struggle of Romans 7 has caused me to know that I'm not able to win this battle myself. That when I trust Jesus and when I have true faith, which is trust and obey in every moment, home, work, road, pleasure, I am am not only a victor over sin, I have the power not to commit the sin that the devil tempts me from on the outside. Those of us who are dominated, not dominated, but those of us who who, who allow the carnal nature to resurface, we've got a double battle on our hands. We've got an interior pull to do wrong, and we've got the devil. He comes right within us, and it's just a wipeout condition, and it's just wipeout, wipeout, wipeout. God's gracious, but I want you to know there's a higher plane of living. There's a plane of victory. There's a plane of victory. As a man places himself in the hands of God, as a man walks in the, in the law of God, for the law of God is actually the Holy Spirit in our minds and in our hearts, he takes over. Dad used to put it like this. He said that the, the man that answers the door when the devil comes knocking, that's the way well, he used to preach it, a man that comes knocking, when the devil comes knocking, the man that opens his own door has lost the battle. But the man that wins the back victory is the man that sends Jesus to the door. Brother, when the devil gets to that door and he meets Jesus, he says, I made a mistake. Goodbye, he's gone. Only in the power of the Holy Spirit can we make it. Is that victory? That's victory. Praise God. Let us stand for prayer. Jesus, sanctify this truth to our hearts. More than that, let us Let us accept the truth of the Word of God and be liberated in it. Let us, O Lord, let us, O Lord, judge ourselves apart from God to be carnal and unable. And let us, O Lord, reckon ourselves to be dead in Christ. And let us, O Lord, place our Lord in the the throne room of our life forever and forever and in every moment. And that's where you touch my heart. And then... It is victory, 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 and it stops this meeting of heaven and hell in our own hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Say, you really want to thank God that he he helped me to tell the story here this morning. (laughs) You really want to thank Jesus. For the man that will obey him, the Holy Spirit will come in and it will not be the life and up, up and downs that it is before because Acts 5.32 says the man who will obey God is the man. Anytime a man chooses to obey God, God's power comes to him to help him. You actually have to choose not to do it. But if you choose to obey God, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit will assist you. And not only that, as, as that man obeys God in the justified life, he will fill that man with the Holy Spirit and give him Give him a life of, of continuous victory. Oh, dear Lord, if I didn't believe that, take me on, Jesus. If I didn't know that was the truth, just let me. Reimer Schultz, he said, after he was saved, he said, Lord, there's a power of sin still in my life. If there's not any greater victory than this, kill me. He said, this is this all there is? I thank you for forgiving my sins, but Lord, I need power over sin in this life. I don't need to have this conflict I'm having. I don't need, and there's a battle always, clear to the end. But this is an inner conflict. He said, I need deliverance. And, you know, he, he contracted TB and was in a sanatorium when a man who was white-headed and white of face was in there also. He brought him to the Scriptures and showed him that there could be victory in this life where the Holy Spirit is possessing the life of that believer. And I'll tell you, Reimer is a happy man today. You know what we might say? It takes the glory to beat the devil. It takes the glory of God in the heart of every man takes the glory of God on a continued basis and you've got to keep the victory by keeping the glory of God in your heart. Otherwise, you fall back into the, into the conflicting state. I'm not saying that a man's lost. I don't see a lost man in Romans 7. I don't see it. I see a man who can't win the battle. But I see that there's an answer. There is a battle that can be won, a war, if you please, and a great victory that's given to us from Calvary. And that touches my heart also.
Praise the Lord. 